Our first speaker this morning is Professor of Astronomy at Manchester University and Jodrell Bank. Please welcome Professor Ian Morrison. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, it's a real privilege, I think, for me to be able to speak to you this morning. I can't see you, but I know you're there somewhere. I'm going to put uh, the theme of this conference into an even wider context and talk about our place in the universe. We live, as you all know, in a solar system. We have now just eight planets. Pluto sadly was demoted three years ago, which is a pity. It has not only an element named after it, but also a rather famous dog. I feel a bit sad about that. At the heart of our solar system, we have our sun. That, of course, is incredibly important to us. It provides the heat and the light that keeps it alive. But stars like our sun have another and very important role. At their heart, in their core, they create energy by nuclear fusion. But in doing so, they build up the heavier elements. And at the end of their lives, happily, they explode. So those elements get spread out into the universe, into the galaxy, in the space between the stars. It allows other stars to form, which have got enough heavier elements to enable solar systems like ours to form. Without that, we could not be here. If you can get to a really dark site and look up at the sky, particularly in the late summer, you can see the arc of what we call the Milky Way overhead. It is our view of our own galaxy that we call the Milky Way. This is a wonderful image. I hope it's dark enough to see. Probably not quite. But it shows the whole sky in the form of a map. We are in a spiral galaxy. It looks a little bit like this. Obviously, we can't take a photograph of it. But with our radio telescopes at Jodrell Bank, we can map out the spiral arms. And we can see what it should look like. We live, in fact, quite close to the bottom. Sorry, wrong one. We live about here, quite near the bottom, towards the edge of our galaxy. And if we look out into space, we see many other galaxies. This is our nearest giant neighbor in space, the Andromeda galaxy. You can see it with your unaided eye. It's 2,000, sorry, it's 2.5 million light years away. It means that if you see it, and you can do, the photons that fall on your retina left there two and a half million years ago, you're looking back into time. Relatively speaking, this galaxy is quite close. Stars, on the other hand, are very far apart. If our sun were the size of a football or a melon, or perhaps a pumpkin, then the nearest star would be somewhere around San Francisco or Los Angeles. The galaxies are pretty empty, really. But in fact, our nearest galaxy is only about 20 times further away than the size of our own. So galaxies tend to be sort of more closely packed together. This is another lovely one called the Sombrero Galaxy, after the Spanish sort of hat that you sometimes see. Another lovely spiral galaxy. This one is about 12 and a half million light years away. It's a bit pinky red in the center. And that's because there are old stars there. Whereas in the spiral arms, there are young stars. And many of those are wonderful blue and very, very bright. So that dominates the color. And here we have a lovely one we call the Whirlpool Galaxy, interacting with a smaller galaxy. That's going to happen to us in about 4,000 million years' time. That Andromeda Galaxy and ours are going to merge into one. I'd love to be around to see that, but sadly not. Galaxies do not like being alone. They group in what we call clusters or groups. We're actually in a relatively small local group which is a fairly posh bit in the outer part of a big supercluster called the Virgo supercluster. In fact, it's a little bit like the Manchester conurbation. You have a central core, the center of Manchester and Salford. That's actually the Virgo cluster. Around that, there are smaller clusters corresponding perhaps to Stockport or Blackburn or Bolton. And then further out still, you have some little groups like ours, a rather posh bit of the universe, a bit like Alderley Edge. Something like that. 
we see these wherever we look out into space. And our telescopes can now look something like 12,000 million years into the past to see the universe shortly after its origin, which is about 13.6 thousand million years ago. So that's where we are. What about our sort of place? Where, where do we fit in? Well, obviously, we are a form of life, and we'd love to know if life exists elsewhere. Well, does life exist in our solar system? Not impossible. A long time ago, Percival Lowell produced this lovely map of Mars showing these canals. It was thought there was an advanced civilization living on the surface of Mars. It has polar caps, for example. Well, as spacecraft to reach Mars, we know that those canals aren't there. We don't think any advanced life could ever have lived there. But some time ago, this photograph was taken. It's obviously a statue, isn't it, or a bust of a Martian telling us what they used to look like. Uh, sadly, a more modern image has shown it's actually a flat top hill, so it's not really a, a picture of a head. But if you squeeze your eyes a bit, you can see it looks like a face. So we don't think there was advanced life, obviously, but if there was, they were certainly a very happy group of people. Well, as spacecraft reached Mars, we saw giant canyons, far bigger than the Grand Canyon in America, but also four massive volcanoes. You can see three of them just over on, on the left here, the largest of which is called Olympus Mons. Its caldera is 60 miles across. When those volcanoes were active, about three and a half thousand million years ago, they produced lava and ash, but lots of gas, water vapor, ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, and others. All those three gases are what we call greenhouse gases because they help trap heat. So when there was quite a thick atmosphere on Mars, it was a lot warmer. And that water vapor could form droplets and rain, and then that rain could fall to give you rise to rivers and lakes and not perhaps oceans. So there were the conditions on Mars 3,000 million years ago for life to arise, and it may well have done so. We don't at the present know. You'd need to have some ice or water, preferably water, available for that life to have survived, should it once have existed. A wonderful craft called the Phoenix Lander has been on Mars, it's now sadly died, but it was there about a year ago, and it dug a trench, and in the bottom of that trench, they could actually see ice here. And over a few days, it evaporated or sublimated away. So we know that Mars has a permafrost. If anywhere under the surface it can be warm, then maybe, if there was once simple life there, it could still be found. Hopefully, within your lifetime, we'll know the answer to that. You might think, as you go further out into the universe, into the solar system, that it's too cold. But Jupiter has a group of satellites, four major ones called the Galilean moons. You can see them here. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. The innermost one looks very odd. It is pot-marked with volcanoes. That means it must be molten inside. And it's molten because of the effects of the massive planet Jupiter nearby. They're called tidal forces. The same forces, in fact, that cause the tides to go up and down on the Earth make Io expand and contract by about 40 meters. It squeezes, a bit like an accordion. And that basically stirs it up and produces the heat. So you can get heat not just from the sun, but if you're in the proximity of a giant planet. Now, that's not an interesting place to be, or at least a very nasty place to be. If you go out one further satellite, though, you come to Europa, you, sorry, Europa. In complete contrast, it has an icy surface. And if you look at it in close-up, you see it's got, essentially, icebergs. It looks as though the icy crust is floating on an ocean of liquid water. If you have liquid water, you could have simple life forms, or even more advanced life forms. And again, I think not in my lifetime, but hopefully in yours, a craft might go there, burrow down 
through the ice and send a little probe out to look for any evidence of life in the ocean beneath. It beneath. So it's not impossible that at two other locations within our own solar system, simple life might be present. Well, we're beginning to discover other solar systems. Just recently, the 400th planet around another star was discovered. Most of those at the moment are very different to our own solar system. It's actually very hard to detect planets the size of the Earth. But that is happening. That is coming. So could there be life out there as well? Well, probably no reason why not. This is one of the smallest of the planets discovered so far, just five times the mass of our own Earth. And that was discovered, in fact, by some of my colleagues at Jodrell Bank. If we look at the atmospheres of those planets, as we are already beginning to do with giant telescopes around the world and the Hubble Space Telescope, we can analyze their atmosphere. We can learn about the gases within it. We can learn about water vapor, carbon dioxide, but also we can detect ozone. You can only have free ozone in an atmosphere if there's free oxygen. Oxygen is very reactive, as you know, and so unless you keep replenishing it, there's no way it could be there on the long term. If we find ozone, it will be very suggestive that life of some form exists on that planet. That will be very exciting to find out. So astronomers suspect that simple life is actually very widespread. It arose here on planet Earth virtually as soon as the Earth could support life. But what about more advanced life like ours? Well, no reason why we couldn't find simple life in many locations. We have a subject called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Could we detect intelligent life elsewhere in our galaxy? Well, with giant radio telescopes, we can listen for any signals. The very first such attempt was made way back in 50, 1960 by Frank Drake in what was called Project Ozma. If any of you watched over the, the um, Wizard of Oz on the television the other day, the land of Oz was the one over the rainbow. Well, they didn't actually detect any advanced life from elsewhere. They did, in fact, detect an American spy plane, which shouldn't have been there at all, but was. We sometimes find these signals, and we say to the Americans, we've got this interesting signal at this frequency, what is it? And they say, well, we'll tell you, but then we'll kill you. Um, the world's largest radio telescope is at Arecibo in Puerto Rico, and that's the most sensitive in the world. And that has made searches for about 10 years for signals from ET. You can join in in something called SETI at home and help analyze the data. That telescope was linked with our own telescope at Jodrell Bank in what was called Project Phoenix, and I was the project scientist for it here in the UK. By linking the two of the world's largest radio telescopes, we had the most sensitive system that's ever been produced for searching for signals from ET. Over six years, not the whole time, but over six years, we looked at about 820 solar systems near our sun, similar to our sun, where perhaps life could evolve on a planet, but sadly, ET did not phone home. How often will simple life evolve into intelligent life? We don't really know, but our moon has helped stabilize the rotation axis of the Earth. And when it was formed, it made our crust quite thin. So we have what is called plate tectonics. That helps recycle carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we need that to keep us warm. If we didn't have that CO2 there, the Earth would be too cold for life. I know it's a problem now, but without it, we would be lost. So that's been important. Comets have been very important. They've brought water to the Earth. About a third of the water we drink probably came from a comet. But when they impact the Earth, as the dinosaurs uh, learnt to their cost, they can wipe out much life. Not too many of them, perhaps because of Jupiter, were rather lucky. So it seems that very few planets, we suspect, could retain a sufficiently stable temperature for the time scales, something like 3,000 million years that have enabled on Earth simple life to develop into advanced life. So although we think that simple life is very common, we honestly suspect 
that advanced life like ours is actually very rare. And I honestly would not be surprised if we were not the only currently advanced civilization in our own galaxy. But of course, there are myriads of galaxies. Somewhere out there, people could be having their equivalent of a TED conference. So, whereas we used to think that life like ours is very common, we now suspect it's rare. Perhaps our human race is, in fact, rather special. And if so, we should take rather special care of both ourselves and our rather lovely planet, the Earth, on which, of course, we live. Thank you for listening.